thank you, Paul, and thank you all for coming to see um, an academic talk before 10 o'clock in the morning. Um, what I want to talk about today then um, is really the boom in short fiction um, that I think is really unprecedented. And I want to account for some of the themes that are present in this work. I want to begin, however, and possibly slightly uncharacteristically, um, with two lines from one of the most famous poems in the Northern Irish literary canon, that is The Flitting by Maeve McGookian. And I want in particular for you to use these two lines, these first two lines from this poem, as sort of the, the touchstone with which to engage with what I'm talking about today. So keep these, these lines um, in your head. I know this poem um, is rich and dense and elusive and has been read by critics in really generative ways for many years, but it's these two lines that I want you to hold in your head, which is, you wouldn't believe all this house has cost me. In body language terms, it has turned me upside down. Now, the reason that I begin with these two lines is really to emphasize the fact really to emphasize the power that of what happens in the domestic arena, what happens in houses, how significant this is, that it has no less the power to turn Magookian speaker upside down. And that's the critical shift that I want this talk really to engage with, is the difference between, um, we always think of public politics as where all the significant things happen, but anyone who has ever lived in a home knows that isn't necessarily where the most significant stuff of life happens. What happens in our homes has the power to turn us upside down. And that's the idea that I really want to engage with today. Now, the period following the Good Friday Agreement then has seen a marked increase in different fictional outputs um, from Northern Ireland, particularly collections of short stories and particularly collections of short stories written by women. Now, towards the end of this talk, I'm going to begin to account for why I think there's been such a, a boom um, in short fiction. Now, this writing didn't come out of nowhere. It extends and develops traditions that um, have been going for years and years and years. So I'm not claiming all of a sudden that in the 21st century, um, Northern Irish women just woke up and wrote lots of novels and short stories, but rather that they're engaging with traditions that have been ongoing since the inception of the state, whether the work of um, Jana McNeil and Anderson, there's been writers that have really been, been experimenting, but I'm interested in why now, and, and what, what is this thing that's happening now, and why is it so exciting? Now, over the years, women have offered a diverse array of perspectives on politics, both inside and outside the home. They've written from a variety of political stances, quite often more interested in feminist and socialist issues rather than sort of across traditional and religious divides. They've also dealt with the subject matter of the troubles directly, but also engaged with themes of reproduction, sexuality, mental health, and the welfare of children and the elderly, all of the important political things. Now, Northern Irish women have also written crime fiction, romance, science fiction, magical realism. They've experimented in a host of other genres. But there does appear to be in the 21st century an unprecedented energy, vigour and sense of community among these writers, a lot of which um, you will have seen this week, particularly encouraged by both the Arts Council, the organisation Women Allowed Northern Ireland, and also by the writer and broadcaster Sinead Gleeson, who I'll be talking about a little bit today. In 2015, she edited The Long Gaze Back, an award-winning anthology of Irish women's short stories, which featured several stories by Northern Irish women. Now, I'm sure people in the audience will have, will have stories about some of these launches of The Long Gaze Back, where essentially afterwards, Sinead stood there while everybody came up to her and was like, but we need one of these for Northern Ireland. And they just sort of harangued her so much. And I think Lucy Caldwell bullied her so much um, that she just decided, all right, I'll give you your own book. And this is where we get um, The Glass Shore. So that's really the stories that I'm going to be talking about today. Now, I know um, that um, there will be another um, collection, um, Female Lines, that will come out next year. Testament to the fact that two anthologies of Northern Irish women's writing in as many years, I think, is quite significant. 
Now, the glass shore was the first significant collection since the female line, an anthology of Northern Irish women writers, which incidentally, if you're interested in a female, this is the thing, right? I obviously am, have been based in England for quite a few years and I'm always talking to um, English literary critics as if I've found this new undiscovered species. But I'm speaking to this knowledgeable, learned audience. So presumably a lot of you have read a lot of this and some of you um, have written some of it as well. So um, so if you're interested in the female lines and you don't have it, it's really cheap to download your Kindle actually um, as well. There's an e-book came out in 2016 that you might be interested in. So in addition to the stories in the glass shore, there's been a remarkable amount of full collections in recent years, including Jan Carson's Children's Children, Roisin O'Donnell's Wild Quiet, Lucy Caldwell's Multitudes, Bernie McGill's Sleepwalkers, and Rosemary Jenkins' Aphrodite's Kiss. Now, will these authors demonstrate a breadth of techniques and subject matter? Generally, and what I'm going to really argue with, with the paper, with, in this paper today, is that this, this fiction is thematically interested in the idea of intimacy and these authors playfully engage with the fictional challenges of representing what goes on in these private spaces in particular i'm going to argue today that the last five stories in the glass shore by by bernie mcgill tara west jan carson lucy caldwin and roshan o'donnell sort of are a sort of almost a, a collective um call to action that really ask for a much more complicated complex and interesting representation of intimacy that we've had before these stories then represent what bernie mcgill terms in her short story acts of casual intimacy. Now these are very much Northern Irish stories. Some represent continuing social constraints that are a legacy um, of past conflicts and others deal importantly with the fraught question of the representation of home. But generally the troubles are not the driving narrative catalyst. The troubles are something else and it's that something else and that more interesting relationship is what I want to think about today. But what I want to begin by doing is by setting out some um, sort of theoretical ideas, because intimacy, of course, is not merely a question for Northern Irish writers. A theoretical reconsideration of intimacy and what falls under the heading of affect theory, or theories that are concerned with what goes on in between people in their emotional lives, are really common throughout contemporary literary criticism. Jennifer Cook and her work um, edited a wonderful um, collection with Bloomsbury about how intimacy works in literature. She called these intimate reading encounters. And I want to think about what it means not just to write about intimacy, but to read someone's writing about intimacy and where that relationship is. Now, I want to think on th this concept and, and how we might use it. It's one of those words that whenever you um, you first hear it, you think, oh my goodness, that's that's going to be a terribly racy talk for 9.45 um, in, in the morning, but get your minds out of the gutter, because intimacy um, has a very broad application. An intimate life can be constructed, experienced, and represented in a variety of ways. It can be a euphemism, for example, which covers a range of ambiguous acts and is often used to sort of insinuate sexual relationships without actually naming the act. Essentially, intimacy is a way of talking about that which is hidden. Now, in the stories under consideration, truths unspoken or partially revealed feature heavily. And the inability to fully articulate and plays a role with, with, within several of them. An intimate then, if you, you refer to someone as an intimate, they are a person who is a confidant, someone who you make sense of what's going on um, in, in your most private moments. But the way you make sense of that is through language, is by setting it out into your own personal narrative or story. To intimate is also to tell someone part of a sensitive story. So you might say, he intimated that he might retire. Intimate, if it's used in that way, is often followed by that sort of a modifier. It's this really conditional word that means both knowing and not knowing. And it's that ambivalence that I really want to draw out today. Now, this ambivalence then is a strong characteristic of the stories under consideration. Within the Northern Irish context then, 
a turn to the intimate could be read as fundamentally a political and that's the question that i really want to draw through today is the is is turning towards the intimate in writing turning away from politics or does it actually mean that we have to broaden out what we think of as politics the public politics then of sectarian conflict and the private politics of intimacy is a binary that can't really be sustained. We can't say that that's all the external political stuff, this is all the internal intimate stuff. It doesn't um, work like that. For example, a lot of encounters um, that have been, have been written about um, domestic violence um, during the Troubles, I'm sure, would bear that out as well. So in intimacy then, we find the interaction of the public knowledge of telling or writing and the private realm of our own hidden knowledge. Intimacy is a way of knowing then, which can only occur through an exchange of mutual understanding. We often learn the culturally appropriate behaviours for our intimate encounters through what we have seen and read. Like think about whenever you um, you were growing up or you were sort of either um, seeing relationships on screen in novels. A lot of our first sort of understandings in addition to our, our family home come from literature, come from culture. That's the way we learn what's appropriate in our society in, in order to be um, intimate. But what I want to think of is how do we reimagine that um, and re-inscribe that? How do we think of different ways and different modes of being intimate. So intimacy in literature then lives at that area between our private and our social worlds and it does not simply represent a sanctuary from the external world. The critic Lauren Berlant, who, who wrote a great um, special issue um, on intimacy, argues that this view of a life that unfolds intact within the intimate sphere represses, of course, another fact about it, the unavoidable troubles, the distractions and disruptions that make things turn out in unpredicted scenarios, moral dramas of estrangement and betrayal, along with the terrible spectacles of neglect and violence, even where desire perhaps endures. Now, the problems of intimacy that Berlant hints here are varied. There's often a, a dis disappointment um, due to if you have a certain way of that you want your intimacy to be performed or to be enacted and your partner has um, a very different um, reason. So that's the, the first way that intimacy can cause conflict. It's a disruptive force on a continuum from the smaller ruptures um, of, of awkward relationships to the larger problems of abuse and violence meted out by a trusted partner or family member. In the stories then, um, the other thing is that I think you can really trace um, the development of Northern Irish fiction from the 20th century due to the 21st century, due to the change relationship with intimacy. In 20th century fiction, we get a lot more um, representations um, of institutional um, and domestic abuse. We get something very different happens in the 21st century. This is something I've written um, about um, a bit about sort of the history of, of 20th century fiction, and I'm more than happy um, to pass some of that work on as well. However, the other thing that a consideration of the intimate um, offers when talking about Northern Ireland is sort of a reverse exceptionalism. Because we love to think we're very special and very different to everybody else in the world, and we've got a very different situation. But actually, intimacy allows us to, to think about more what we have um, in common. Bodies are not necessarily encoded um, with the legacy of violent civil conflict during um, a pleasant encounter. But as these acts are framed with a narrative set in Northern Ireland, how do we square that? And that's some of the ideas that I want to think about today. For example, in a really wonderful um, book about do um, domestic space in Northern Irish poetry, Adam Hanna argues that the house is really the main sort of contested space within sort of Heaney, McGookie and, and Longley. And I just love, I think he summarises these conflicts really well when he says, Dwelling places were such frequent targets of violence during the years of the Troubles, and that they so often still carry symbols that indicate the political sympathies of their inhabitants, indicates that in a landscape where the operations of national power have left contentious legacies, the results of which are apprehended every day, private dwellings take on significances that are inescapably public and political in nature. 
So that sort of set up the idea that intimacy um, is significant to Northern Irish writing, that it appears in different forms and different ideas and has since the inception of Northern Irish writing in the 1920s. However, what I want to draw out today then is why the short story? Why has, has, has this short story um, boom happened um, at this time? Now, what I want to argue then is that the short story is ideally suited to the current moment um, within Northern Ireland. Short stories are by their nature sort of elliptical. So what I mean by that is there's always something hidden within the short story. You think of, so for example, if there was a novel that dealt entirely with intimacy and sensation, first of all, it would sound a bit pornographic, um, but a short story can do something about relationships that a novel can. Like it would feel, it would feel tiring, that, that sort of encounter. But in a short story, and I'm thinking in particular of sort of the, the Joycean mode or Catherine Mansfield, and I'll talk a bit about modernism in a second, is that a short story allows you to reach a really intense um, moment or encounter that, uh, that then you can move on to the next thing and you can have it fleeting. And the whole idea about short stories is they're all about what's not said, what's left out, how elliptical they are. So what I'm going to argue is that that idea that I talked about with intimacy, that it's always partially hidden, is ideally suited for the short story. Now, short stories can allow us a temporary, intense intimacy with a subject. And Jennifer Cook notes that the short story is able to capture the specificity of a particular moment or encounter. Now, it's this idea of a moment, and I'm obsessed with this idea of a moment. I think my final year modernist students are sick of me blethering on about the, the concept of a moment and how significant it is. Because I'm using that in particular um, to think about, to think through um, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway. Now, in Mrs. Dalloway, she uses the word moment. Um, I'm sure someone will correct me on this, but I think over 70 times this word, word the moment. And, it, and obviously the novel, the novel is very sensual, deals with relationships. But the idea of, of the one moment, the fleeting moment, absolutely capturing that one moment in time, it's a very imagist idea. It's a very modernist idea of kind of holding, holding that moment. I actually think the way that Wolf talks about it is more generative than any of these, the, these theoretical ideas that I've set up as well. Now, Heather Ringman, in an excellent book, An Excellent History of the Irish Short Story, notes that the modernist inheritance is particularly vivid in contemporary Irish short fiction when she notes that the short story, perhaps more than any other form, has been associated with modernity in terms of experimentation and theme. Now, I want to argue that the, the, the history of modernism is visible in Northern Irish women's writing, that intellectual um, inheritance. It was often the case um, in, um, in the 1980s and 1990s that Northern Irish women's fiction was sort of hauled over the cold for not being experimental enough, as if writing as a woman in Northern Ireland in the 80s and 90s wasn't a brave enough act um, by itself. They were often critiqued for not falling in with kind of, you know, kind of glib sort of showy postmodernism in the 80s and 90s, more preferring the realist mode, more preferring like holding up this this awful thing that happened to me, you know, and kind of rendering it in, in, in fiction, I think was really was really the the imperative. But what I want to really think about is that there really seems to be a renewed interest in the the fragmentation, the experimentation, the techniques of modernism. And I think I think that that's something that I'm writing about at the moment and I'm really I really look forward to hearing um, some of your ideas if you see that too. Because what the short story allows you to do is not just connect with the modernist moment um, of Dubliners, as I've mentioned, the garden party, as I've mentioned, it also allows you to really uh, sort of dig into the prominent modernist Irish short story collection, which includes, you know, Mary Lavin, Sean of Whelan, Maeve Brennan. The short story, and I'm sure, you know, d different writers will have different opinions on what brought them to the short story, but I think it's really rich um, for both of those particular reasons. So 21st century Northern Irish women's writing then has produced work which is consistently challenging and innovative. The short story also functions as a way for newer writers, a lot of, a lot of women that are writing out of writers groups to sort of test, test their writing out for the first time. It's easier then, I think, if, if, you sort of, if you're limited with your um, sort of institutional um, sort of forebears, it's often a really interesting way to try out ideas in that sort of a, a, of a community. But I want to argue that this process of Northern Irish women in writing groups 
all over the country trying out new ideas it has a really important um, political ramification. I want to argue no less that, and this is you using Cook, that the ways we write and the forms in which we choose to write about our most intimate states, such as love or mourning, are capable of altering our conceptions of them. And I think that's really important and argues for how significant the literary representation of intimacy is. Now, I want to talk about these five stories. I have about 17 minutes to do that. So um, I might get three of them done. I might get five of them done. Depends on how, how quick I'm going to rattle through them. I'll get, the, I'll get, I'll get Bernie McGill, Tara West and Jan Carson, definitely. And then if we have the other ones, I'm more than happy um, either to talk about them afterwards or this piece um, is going to be published um, in, a, in a literary handbook next year. So I'm more than happy um, to send you along um, any drafts of that as well. So the first story that I'm going to talk about is Bernie McGill's The Cure for Too Much Feeling. All right, okay, so I should, I should do um, a, a bit of a, a sort of turn it back on you now because I've been, I've been talking for a long period of time. Put your hand up if you've read the stories of the glass shore. Well, obviously you have, you wrote one of them. <laughs> um, right, that's okay. So of some people that are very well invested in the glass shore, other people should know better and should buy a copy um, immediately after this. Unless you don't care about Northern Irish women, of course. Um, so... Um, <laughs> Bernie McGill's story then, the cure for too much feeling, begins with the protagonist suffering from barely perceptible physical ailments. With Rita, it had begun gently, a slight quiver in the hand, acid in the stomach. When she receives a clean bill from her doctor, the realisation dawns on her that her symptoms are psychosomatic and caused by a newly developed susceptibility to other people's misery. Every time she listens to people talk about their ailments, she starts to get sick as well. Strangers' intimacies with her lead her to a pain she herself can barely speak of. The narrative then brings us back to an intimate encounter from her girlhood, sex with a married father when she was still at school. Now this has ambiguous consent at best. She didn't remember agreeing to anything, but she hadn't wanted to appear ungrateful. Now following it and the baby she gives up for adoption, she withdraws entirely from the realm of the intimate. So has an intimate encounter that she does not enjoy and then sort of retreats entirely from that realm. <laughs> She develops strategies to avoid intimacy, including drinking single serving cans of gin and tonic so that she won't have to go to the pub and have anyone talk to her. She can no longer bear having an intimacy with any, um, any sort of sad news at all. Watching reports of the refugee crisis, she was near crippled by the look in the children's dark eyes, the sorrow of it seeping into her. Now, when she meets the daughter that she gave up for adoption, their contact is brisk and businesslike. And it seems like she'll just go on. She's had this encounter and she'll just go on with her life. But the intimate doesn't, doesn't work like that. It doesn't happen that this you know, intimate encounter happens, therefore we react in this way. We all know that we react in these different, really complex, really interesting, rich ways to these sorts of encounters. Sheltering from a storm um, in botanic gardens, she finds herself first deeply embarrassed by the explicit art in the museum, and finally in the throes of what is her most intimate encounter um, in, in the whole short story, and that's with, um, with an artwork. Now this ekphrastic moment at a painting washing mother's hair surprises her. It doesn't bring on her symptoms, but it leads to something else where she notices. Their physical closeness in the cramped room, the daughter's right hand pouring water, her left hand outstretched like a benediction. Now this moment offers her a glimpse at something akin to the divine and it's that idea of, of the intimate as something that offers us um, a glimpse into the sacred. I think it's something and really relevant to a lot of the stories I'll talk about today. It seemed to Rita that if she could stand there for long enough, if they would let her stay, if the purple-shirted attendant would put out the lights and lock up the gallery and go home and leave her there, that she might witness a quiet miracle. Now, in front of this painting, she has a quiet, powerful revelation about what a full, vulnerable, intimate life might look like. 
And it seemed to Rita that she would be privy to the sort of act of casual intimacy that passes unannounced in homes everywhere where people are tired or hurting or weak and still going about the everyday business of caring for one another and of being loved. In Withdrawing from Human Contact then, McGill writes Rita as someone who has removed herself from the variety of encounters which constitute intimate life. She seems to be suggesting in this story that intimacy is a fundamental part of how we connect and experience the world. She speaks for women then that have issues expressing themselves after an unwanted encounter and raises the question of what happens to those who cannot sort of, sort of expend their intimate energies for want um, of, of a better word. And this speaks to a, to a comment from Lauren Berlant, that theorist I, men I mentioned earlier, who asks, what happens to the energy of attachment when it has no designated place, to the glances, gestures, encounters, collaborations, or fantasies that have no canon? So obviously within these stories, we get a variety of relationships um, represented, relationships um, across that are politically taboo for various different reasons. But I think Berlant's provocation is really interesting here. Like, what happens to them? Where does that energy go? And I think fiction's a really ideal place to represent some of these ideas. Now, I'll talk briefly um, about Tara West's um, short story, The Speaking and the Dead, which is about a woman, Elaine, who turns to a stage um, medium after the suicide of her son. Now, the act of mediumship, I'm really interested in this act of mediumship and what it means for the concept of intimacy. Because mediumship is really an attempt to fake intimacy. You know, you're, and they had a gold and she liked this. And, you know, and I think what the story does really well is to talk about how the, how the medium fakes intimacy with all of the people um, who come on stage. But it's impossible, ultimately, to fake real intimacy. It's possible, the medium does it, to sort of offer surface level intimacies, but it's truly impossible um, to fake real intimacy. Now, the story is replete with the problems and the discordances of intimacy. Elaine and her partner are trying to negotiate their relationship after their son's death. And Elaine has an uneasy relationship with her friends. While they share a love of vodka in their handbags and crying at the X Factor, it's clear through their exchanges that this is not a friendship of true intimacies, where we're told. Over years, their friendship had grown into an unspoken competition, fought in the arenas of weight, food, poverty, victimhood, and whatever else could be construed. Now, the Belfast medium then essentially demonstrates shortcuts to faking intimacy. She makes broad statements about the deceased to maximize identification. For example, she talks about a woman's mother being a neat freak who left her a piece of jewelry and had an important man in her life. Now this fakery in particular, this fakery of intimacy is undercut as Elaine's friend insists on enthusiastic participation. By the time the interval comes, Jackie has claimed Lorraine, a painter and decorator named Phil and a pipe smoking man known as Lorenzo. Now West's control of the narrative is very powerful. I think this is, this is, this is, what, this is one of the most interesting um, stories in the volume because you get real pathos and real moments of humour as well. Elaine's genuine plaintive desire to have some communication with her son where she wonders, what happened, Matt? Where did you go? She has desperately sought intimacy and connection with her son. She has seen every kind of medium, amateurs in the living room, stars in big hotels, Romany in fairground tents, and squinty oddballs over Skype. We get so many glimpses then in this story into the pain of living with a loved one as she talks about um, what it was like um, with her son um, while he was suicidally depressed, where she tells us, when he wasn't surly and silent, he was in a rage. He screamed at Elaine and Paul, always stayed in his room. Now her realization during, during the fake intimacy is simple and powerful and speaks to the pain of loss. Matt has gone to emptiness, is emptiness, and her desperation would serve as amusement for everybody else. She always hesitated because she never really believed he would come. She just can't let go of the hope. At the end of the story then, she comes home to her husband snoring on the sofa. And the final act of the story is one of tenderness. She's always complaining about how useless her husband is. But I think this final moment of intimacy is, is, is one of the most powerful um, in the story where she hears. 
Paul's snoring has stopped and his stomach rises and falls, a slow, familiar rhythm. She tucks her fingers around his. And there's something about the fact that she's always been complaining about him, but at the end, she comes down, lies beside him on the couch and, and holds his hands. And I think that's, there's something really remarkably um, powerful um, about that. I'm going to, you know, kind of mortify Jan by talking about her while she's sitting there, but that's okay. Um, I'll only say nice things. Um, so, settling with Jan Carson then um, appears at first to be a traditional um, emigrant narrative of a Northern Irish couple who moved to England for work. However, soon we see that the story is marked by a complex engagement with intimacy of the past and present. Often their relationship is marked by false starts and failures to connect. It could have been the perfect moment to make love, but we hadn't the curtains up yet, and the neighbours could see right into our room from their kitchen. There's always a sense of, of what's internal and what's external um, in, in the story, as, as the, the father, for example, you know, do, leaves their underwear you know, kind of out, um, in, in a box outside, and that's, that's an absolute horror. And the squeamishness extends in particular um, to the narrator's boyfriend, who has a horror of laundrettes. He doesn't want anyone seeing the stains we make. And the, a lot of the first um, half of the story is about sort of a, a sort of emotional continence of kind of keeping everything in bodily, physically, emotionally. Now he seeks to maintain then and strengthen the imagined boundaries between public and private. But Carson's narrative then seeks to really destabilize these by introducing um, a figure my grandmother is in the wardrobe, sitting on a deck chair. I think she's reading the Belfast Telegraph. It is very hard to tell in the dark. Now, I don't want to sort of put any particular label um, on this figure because I think that's what's absolutely brilliant um, about the story. It's not, it's not a traditional um, haunting. And typical of Carson's fiction then, the narrative is careful not to give away too much about this otherworldly character who is depicted in a sort of a matter of fact way and doesn't have any sort of eerie qualities. There's something about the everyday intimacy that I think makes this really interesting. It is however the narrator who becomes the spectre as she looks in the mirror. Here is my white face hanging like a ghost. I haunt myself and the shock of this makes me step back sharply, clawing my heel on a suitcase. Now she describes the intimacy with her, grand her grandmother as being like coming across your own face reflected in a window and on your own easy. She imagines the tea and thick slices of toasted Vita bread. Incidentally, I did give this, give this talk um, in, in Cambridge and they did ask me um, what Vita bread was, um, which I found um, personally offensive. Um, so, um, she tries to tell then her grandmother um, that she loves her. She tries to create this intimacy, but the narrator and the, the grandmother silences her. And we sort of hear, my family does not do sentimentality. So she has this figure that she's comfortable and intimate with, but that figure is then negotiating the boundaries of where that intimacy is. In the story then, the city of London is posited as the opposite of this intimacy. And while Matt embraces this distance, our narrator codes it as alienation. She is troubled by the contrast between the intimacy with, with her grandmother and the, the anonymity um, that, that her partner wants. Everything is quick and straight and sure of its own skin. It is not a place for grandmothers or any other truths unseen. Now he seeks for their social circle to shrink and their visits home to become less frequent. And she has internalized the idea that to want intimacy is a personal feeling. I can't be only looking forwards. This is a form of weakness and I am ashamed. The more her partner detaches, the more vivid the image of her grandmother becomes. In the morning, she may be gone or we may drink tea together and say it does not taste the same without a teapot. Either way, I will be splitting in two. This sensation then of splitting contrasts with the settling of the title of the story, suggesting that beneath the compromised comfort of settling whether into or for something, that always masks a, a conflict and a divided self. This wrenching then is unspoken, suggesting that the narrator's intimacy with her partner has become fractured by her silent disquiet. So I'm going to talk about the, the, the last two stories um, quite quickly, um, but I'm more than happy, like I said, to either pass on this work or to talk about them um, over questions um, afterwards. Lucy Caldwell's poignant short story, Mayday, centres around um, a Northern Irish student who takes medication um, to end a pregnancy. 
Now, the short story then takes place um, over the course um, of, of this um, procedure taking place. And the title May Day, of course, refers not just to the emergency distress signal, but also the first holiday of spring, but also um, to um, The Handmaid's Tale, to the plot of The Handmaid's Tale as well. Now, her distress then, um, as the narrator's mind wanders between abject worry about the legal and medical consequences of her decision and reminiscences about her Ulster childhood, it is striking then that she returns to moments of her Protestant childhood infused with religion, imagining her teenage cross-community music group and remembering an embarrassing incident where she accidentally chewed a communion wafer. This act then of something that sticks in the throat is mirrored in the moments where the truth remains unspeakable, where she imagines the ghouls of light in the, sta the stained glass windows of the Catholic Church. Her youth then is portrayed as often idyllic, and she's also, um, but it's also sort of riven with a lot of the, the taboos of Northern Irish society as well. She's ashamed um, when in a school debate, um, a classmate um, sort of chastises her um, for, for, um, for the decision that, that she eventually um, makes. I want to briefly then, I just want to finish, um, I, like I said, I'm more than happy to pass on this work about this as well. Um, I want to just finish then um, with Roisin O'Donnell's um, short story, The Seventh Man, just because I think it's a really um, sort of glorious, uh, gloriously um, romantic story um, to end on. So it's a contemporary retelling um, of, of the myth of the Hag of Bear, who had her youth seven times over, but it retells it as a love story where she um, has really has, has agency rather than is just sort of framed as a, as a succubus. So O'Donnell casts her then as a seductress who was able to rework herself depending on her targets. I have met him metamorphosized so often to suit each husband's fantasy. I no longer know which version of myself is real. Now, after her utilitarian relationships to essentially, you know, suck all the, the life force out of, the, out of these out of these marks, um, she, she fi finally finds a relationship that has within it real, real intimacy. Where you hear, I feel it in my pores, the crinkling of my humanity. I love that phrase. With the six others, it was never like that. She finds this relationship. Um, obviously, I love the fact that the, the, the Hag of Bear on, on, on Tinder, I think, is the, is, is, is the best um, part of the story, where I like the sound of Tinder. It sounded like timber, things being chopped and tossed into the fire, <laughs> smouldering, sparking, cracking, an excellent start to a marriage. And this way that new technologies are being used to sort of modify and change the way that we conduct our intimate relationships is something that a lot of contemporary Northern Irish writers, in particular O'Donnell, um, are engaging with. However, it is the everyday, the acts of casual intimacy that really disarm this supernatural force when we hear. And remember the sincerity with which he went about preparing dinner for me. In this supernatural tale, then, the everyday takes on a quality almost more magical than her rejuvenating body. Intimacy is not a weakness here, but rather it is strength. What if I could summon the lifeblood of a captured Spaniard, the breath of an Ulster aristocrat, the pulse of a soldier caught between wars? Our narrator gained power from her intimacy with men in rather um, a more literal way than some of the other stories. With every kiss, she grew stronger until finally she acts as a repository of her own physical history. She sacrifices then the history of faked intimacies for this real connection. And as she prepares to give him up so that he can live after he falls ill, she remembers the moments, the acts of casual intimacy that bind them to each other. And he won't remember sitting in a Mexican restaurant on a cork side street, a hot city breeze drifting through the open shutters and a comfortable quiet swishing between us like a secret. He won't remember the first night we lay together and how he stumbled into the shower afterwards, weak kneed, drenched, leaving steamed up love notes in the bathroom mirror. Now the stories of the glass shore then cumulatively represent an attempt to find new ways of writing about intimacy in Northern Ireland. They deal with subject matter that is outside the traditional representational norms for Northern Irish fiction, but they are also in many ways about a certain kind of rootedness and the way that we find ourselves coming back home. Back for one last um, critical quote to Berlant, who tells us that rethinking intimacy calls out 
not only for redescription, but for transformative analyses of the rhetorical and material conditions that enable hegemonic fantasies to thrive in the minds and on the bodies of subjects, while at the same time attachments are developing that might redirect the different routes taken by history and biography. Now, I know that's dense, but it's essentially um, Berlant provoking us to find new ways of writing and thinking. And also, um, I know that there are some critics here, there are some writers here, there are all, all different sorts of people who engage with literature in all different sorts of ways. But Berlant's really telling us that writing and thinking about intimacy is a really powerful act. And arguably, there's no more urgent cultural landscape in which the intimate needs to be reimagined by writers and by critics in Northern Ireland. In The Glass Shore then, and in the stories um, that, that are circulating in this massively rich body of writing, we really do see a reinscribing of the intimate. These authors then are engaged in both subtle and overt ways of dismantling accepted ways of living, drawing out those moments which showcase the limitations, awkwardnesses and joys of intimacy. All of these stories place relationships with others at their core rather than the violent political history of Northern Ireland. But equally, they don't fetishise it and they don't say, oh, I'm going to turn away from politics and turn inwards. They allow what happens um, in the domestic to have that turning upside down that I spoke about at the start of the talk. They don't fetishise these relationships, they don't turn inwards. All of these stories involve interplay between our private scripts of intimacy and the public structures they inhabit to offer glimpses into a life which will hopefully lead to more and more diverse fictions of Northern Irish intimacy. Thank you. Ooh.